believe it's a seed that is planted on us and goes as we go but without the gardener there can be no life like michael jackson said we are the children we are the world we make a change today for a better tomorrow Look, I'm here, don't be afraid to shed a tear Tell me your problems, go ahead, I wanna hear Look, you're my child, I really wanna lend an ear If you want, I'll start, I'll even tell you what I fear I'm scared of spiders, yes, I'm afraid of heights I'm scared to lose you, the thought makes me wanna cry Let's start fresh, let's put our differences aside I could make it better, please, just let me try Tell you about my problems, now you wanna listen All this time I needed you, always you were missing Remember you would beat me after late night drinking I had to go to school, the next Day I was limping. The teachers there would ask. I would tell them that I fell. Cause no one there could help me. Who was there to tell? Forever I'ma hate you. With passion as I yell. I never will forgive you, even if I go to hell. As many things that you've been through, just be strong and you will make it through. We've seen you fall and now we see you stand. You gotta go through this. You must understand. To the parents, only time will tell, and you can ask for forgiveness, but forgive yourself, cause everybody makes mistakes, we should know that well, somewhere, somehow, even an angel fell, sometimes you get confused, sometimes you get lost, all the pain that you felt, all the pain that you caused, you weren't strong, you were weak, you don't get no applause, you give up and lose your child, that's a terrible cause, to the child. All the pain, all the hate that will eat you alive Won't live long at this rate If you don't want to live, take a step to your fate But you do, cause your eyes are still wide and awake I know life ain't easy, but you must understand We only fall and get back up and then we do it again Everybody will hurt you, some less and some more But it's the ones that's really worth suffering for As many things that you've been through Just be strong and you will make it through We've seen you fall and now we see you stand You gotta go through this, you must win a friend To not give up are probably some of the hardest words to understand I mean, what does that mean? Perhaps it means that we have been given the serenity to accept the things we cannot change The courage to change the things we can And the wisdom to know the difference We just need somebody to tell us that everything is gonna be okay as you get weak and you can't take the pain Just think of all the things you succeeded in gain Those tears you cry will eventually fade Now stand up and take control of the rain You never know what life will bring us Until we fight and make you see us All you need is an open mind to see what you find through these hard times, I know you're in pain, and I can see it, I believe in you, you can make it, it's change, inspiration, now take it, and embrace it. Just be strong and you'll make it through. You gotta go through this to my friend is friend. That's a song. Hi, I'm Dottie Fuentes, and I am a licensed mental health counselor. I have four special guest panel panelists who are going to talk about something that's very important to our hearts. The four panelists that we have here today are advocates for children. They care about the issues that face our kids, and we want to provide an opportunity to discuss <coughs> child abuse in our community, provide some education about what to do if you suspect child abuse, and looking for some of the warning signs. We are working in conjunction with Terry Doran for a Fort Wayne Children's Museum so that as a community we can address the mental health needs of our kids. I'd like to start with our first panelist. If you could introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your experience. Sure, my name is Vanessa Hogan. I'm also a licensed mental health counselor um, in addition to being a licensed clinical addiction counselor. Um, I work with families, kids, and youth through the Department of Child Services in Indiana. 
Um, and I do a lot of home-based sessions. Um, that's the majority of my work in addition to supervising staff who provide home-based sessions and sessions in schools. Um, I work a lot with people with addiction issues, so that's really my passion and how that affects kids is why I'm here today. Thank you. I'm Linda Hartley and I'm a MSW licensed clinical social worker. Uh, I have been in the field about 35 years and I specialize in children and family um, issues. I practice in a uh, public mental health as well as a private practice um, and I focus on uh, family dynamics as well as child abuse. Thank you. Hi, my name is Connie Ramos and I'm also a licensed clinical social worker. Um, previously, uh, in my current position, I am a school-based therapist. I work with children and adolescents in the schools as well as my uh, in the, uh, outpatient basis. Prior to this position, uh, I used to work with juvenile sex offenders. So, uh, so about 20 years of working with uh, traumatized children. Um, so it's, it is a passion for me and I'm honored to work here to try to help every, uh, the community mm -hmm. on this subject. Uh, my name is Thomas Carter. I work in the uh, settings of mental health, uh, mental health center, and also in private practice. I, am a, uh, I have a master's degree in counseling psychology, degrees in social work, and also <laughs> licensed in mental health counseling and addictions, and also a registered play therapist. I work uh, primarily with children, but I also work with adults through a program that helps them to uh, change some of the life uh, patterns that they have lived that have affected their children. So it kind of gives them a second chance to help to repair some of the damage that's been done to their children. Tom, you're also the author of a book. Uh, yes. That, could you uh, share a little bit yeah, about your um, book? I am an author of a book called uh, Discovering the Lost Key, Using Your Natural Born Skills to Bring Healing. The, the purpose for this book is to try to impress upon individuals that we're all born with gifts uh, that, uh, whether we call them ancestral traits, call them what you want, but we all have them. But through the pain and loss and tragedy and trauma we've experienced, sometimes we abandon our abilities. So the purpose for this book is to help you to rediscover those abilities that you abandoned or misplaced and gives you the ability to heal yourself through the support systems of a therapist, minister, churches, and, and whatever you have that is a healthy, safe place to be. And that's what the book is all about. Thank you, Tom. And we are going to talk a little bit more about the book, but I'd like to start today with talking about trauma. We are, we're coming here because we want to educate the community about child abuse, but I'd like to broaden our definition of child abuse into looking at trauma in a, in a broad sense. And I'd like to ask one of you to explain mm -hmm. what trauma is. Tom? Well, I mean, there's many different mm -hmm. levels of trauma. For me, trauma is kind of like an out of control train. You can't get out of its way to hitch a sudden impact. And that's something where you're immediately in a, in a situation of powerlessness, complete powerlessness. Uh, whether that is verbal or physical, emotional, sexual, either way, you can't stop that train. You're powerless. And so what happens is you, you end up going within yourself and hiding and, mm -hmm. until you're able to find freedom from that. That's an excellent uh, definition. I've not heard something like that before. But I'd also like to add that um, with children, Trauma is, you know, um, on a different, I mean, comes to them in, a, in many different ways that we don't necessarily recognize. For instance, I'm quite concerned with the number of um, violent films and uh, computer games. And what the research shows on trauma to the brain is that children don't, the brain does not know the difference between um, life trauma in reality and these traumas on uh, uh, our electric, electrical devices, and so um, encouraging families to uh, reduce or abstain completely would be my choice from uh, you know violent types of uh, uh, recreation 
if you will, and because the brain doesn't know any difference to the development uh, when they see these kinds of things as well. So, and I think one of one of the important things for people to understand is that trauma is anything that causes the brain to feel a sense of um, <clears throat> fight or flight. And so if we define trauma, we understand that it's a biological response. Trauma can be car accidents, the, the war, being on the news, seeing the things that are on the news, violent video games, violent movies, um, and then we have things such as child abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, that's also trauma. So if we can look at trauma in a broad sense, child abuse and neglect is a piece of the puzzle of trauma. And each one of us work um, with children that have experienced various forms of trauma. For today's discussion, we want to provide education about child abuse. Um, and I'd like to start with emotional abuse. And I think that is something that is um, maybe minimized in some ways. And there's a lot of misunderstandings about what is emotional abuse. So who would like to? I'd like to say mm -hmm. something about that. I think that if we look at all abuse, the one thing that, that the one defect that we experience, the children experience, is when their reality is being denied. Telling a child that you can't tell, or um, coercion, or mm -hmm. threat, or this is going to happen to you, what you're doing is you're denying their reality. Uh, and, and that goes deeper than anything. That there alone, whether it's verbal, uh, where you're screaming at the child, telling them that they cannot tell anyone, not even their best friend, not the school teacher, or telling them to make excuses for that run, that bruise on their shoulder, tell them that you fell down. Again, how long do you deny their reality? It takes away their true existence. Within the state, at least of Indiana, emotional abuse in terms of protecting the child is um, very difficult to um, have any action taken or, you know, it's very hard to define. Yes. So it uh, kind of gets you in a uh, difficult situation when you're mo working with children who are emotionally abused by, you know, even if it's between two very angry parents who are divorcing, but the child's being told two different things, um, or they're being yelled at with obscenities and, and things. But it's very hard to get any protective action to be taken. And I do think that <clears throat> if we, w when we're talking about these different forms of abuse, that we do not work, none of us on this panel work mm -hmm. for the state of Indiana. We are all counselors advocating for children. So how we see mm -hmm. trauma and how we see abuse may not be the legal definition mm -hmm. of, of physical abuse or sexual abuse or emotional abuse. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think what Linda said is really important that from the perspective of Child Protective Services, there is not a lot that we can do to report um, emotional abuse or get it to be a case that the state further investigates, but it's still our job as counselors to advocate for our kids and help them feel whole. So just keep that in mind as we're talking about abuse, that we are not looking at it from a legal definition mm -hmm. or from the perspective the perspective of Child Protective Services that we are advocates for our children, whether the state sees it as a legal, you know, if the state sees it as a need for a legal intervention or not. So, yeah, I don't know how many uh, teenagers, even children I've had, that they say, when I have them say, you know, words that wound, uh, being called stupid, being called fat, being called uh, just any kind of name that they still remember and still to this day believe. So to them, yeah, it, it, to the state, that's not that's not mm -hmm. enough to, to do anything about. Mm -hmm. But these children that I see as teenagers or even as uh, young adults are still remembering and still live under that cloud that they're stupid and can't do anything mm -hmm. or you know they're not worthless. So they have to pick this mom beside or that dad, and they're caught in the middle and they're just. Uh, they're caught in the middle and tra traumatized by that too. So, you know, they they come to us. They're vulnerable. Uh, they may have met us for the first time, and we're telling them mm -hmm. that they're in a safe place, and we're telling them to trust us. Well, we have to help them to do that. How are they supposed to trust when uh, the, maybe the ones that they 
are the closest to are the ones that are hurting them. And I was just thinking about what the definition of, of let's say, uh, psychological emotional abuse is, and so I think I'm just going to read something here. Um, it is defined in the mental health system as uh, something that is motivated by power and control. It is defined emotional abuse as including rejecting, degrading, terrorizing, isolating, corrupting, exploiting, defying emotional responsiveness. That's, that's an awful lot of stuff to say. And when a child comes in to talk to us, all the child says is, do I belong here? And we help them to belong. That is the first step. Am, am I okay? Am I really stupid? Am I really fat? Am I really ugly? And we have to help them understand, no, that's what somebody or something tried to help or make you believe in that to make them feel better. That's very selfish of those individuals. They take mm -hmm. the most vulnerable being, which is a child, and mm -hmm. telling them they don't belong. And so our job is to help them to belong, to fit in. Mm -hmm. And often how I see that is it's a generational pattern of abuse and neglect that cycles through families. That the At the point which we are intervening with families is not the first time it has happened in my experience. Usually it's been a cyclical event and families have experienced this, whether from their parents, step parents, uh, grandparents, it's very much generational. So I think the, the sooner we can get involved on a preventative level, the better off our, our children will be because they will see something different and then they can treat their children differently and they can experience life that doesn't involve trauma and doesn't involve abuse and neglect, whether the wounds can be seen or not seen. Mm -hmm. So I think the preventative aspect that is kind of the passion that drives me to continue educating families continues um, continues just to help me keep going every day when we see this kind of traumatic stuff on a daily basis. And I think that forums like this help us bring, generate that conversation about um, emotional abuse like we're talking about right now, that words do hurt. And we, I think, minimize that sometimes. Um, the old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, you know, but we do know that words, words hurt mm -hmm. our kids. And so as adults, we need to look at how we do talk to our kids and what we are, um, what we are teaching them about interacting with other people. Um, so emotional abuse is one type of abuse that I think um, we need to talk about more. We also have physical abuse. Physical abuse is one that oftentimes we can see um, that there may be a, a bruise or in you know other cases broken bones. Physical abuse has a lot of different long-term effects. Um, I'd like to ask mm -hmm. you guys about some of how would you define physical abuse? Um, I, I'm going to define it as any ep, any episode of physical aggression. You know, uh, slapping a child. Um, I know that we're going to probably get in a discussion about spanking. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to say that there's absolutely no need for the hand to be used for that purpose. Um, when a child holds on to a parent's hand or a caregiver's hand, that's supposed to be a person that's guiding them, protecting them. And when that same hand is used to hit them, it gives a total different message. Um, our body doesn't uh, perceive it as a, uh, they're just disciplining me. It's, I'm being hurt. They feel it. The body feels that hit. And it runs right through the body, the whole being. So I'm going to say any type of hitting. That's always confusing to me, too. Um, and because uh, we're, we're bringing our children up with, uh, we mean to bring up with values and morals and, um, but there's a double standard about hitting. Um, I, I'm part of a, a group of people out of Riley Hospital for infant and toddler mental health, which a lot of people have not really wanted to grasp that age group for mental health, but we, we, I won't divert, di digress just to that, but um, children do have memories, even if they're pre-verbal. Uh, which makes it more complicated sometimes to heal. <laughs> uh, but in terms of hitting, it's such a double standard. We, we may um, have parents 
uh, who hit children, but when they go to school and they're stressed and they're angry with someone who's disappointed them or not been fair and they hit, there's a consequence. So it's quite a confusing standard to teach. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I, so I, you, to me, I would just like to say, well, let's not hit anybody. And then maybe we'd have a clearer way of handling some things in school. Uh, but we, we kind of start off real early teaching about hitting. And then they go to school, you know, and I always kind of look at that as, I believe it's a crime to hit another adult, mm -hmm. I, you, right. you know? And so I, I kind of use that a little bit with, with parents when I'm working with them. Um, but I do agree that not, it's just not necessary. There's other ways to reach your children. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, um, I'm known for talking way too much, and I'll try not to do it here today. Mm -hmm. But there's a very old book that I know some of us have read from that says to spare the rod to spoil the child. And there's been an awful lot of people through a lot of years who have been misinterpreted that as meaning the kid. Don't let them get away with anything. Don't let them talk back. And yet when a child learns to say no, that's part of their independence. They need to be able to do that. It gives them self-worth, makes them feel confident. But uh, I do believe if you read it correctly, it means uh, has something to do with a, uh, the shepherd and his goat or his sheep. How after hundreds of years that was misinterpreted and justifies an awful lot of people that says, that's right, don't let them get away with anything. Mm -hmm. That's how we teach them. And uh, we're learning. Mm -hmm. The rest mm -hmm. of that book is really good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very good, very good. I think one of the things about physical abuse and spanking um, is that we, I have heard parents say that um, they were told that if they don't leave a bruise or they don't leave a mark that it's not considered physical abuse, that it's okay to spank your child as long as you don't leave a bruise. And again, I just want to reiterate that we are coming from a mental health perspective and saying that hitting a child teaches them the wrong message mm -hmm. whether you're you know you're trying to change a behavior from a mental health perspective that is trauma mm -hmm. and that I like what mm -hmm. Linda and Tom said that hitting a child does not change the behavior it instills fear and fear causes the brain to react in a fight-or-flight mm -hmm. mode mm -hmm. and if a child is always in a fight-or-flight mode they can't learn how to regulate themselves and change the behaviors so just remember that we are <laughs> mental health counselors and that we, I, I think it is important to make that, to define that because we do not support that idea that if you don't mm -hmm. leave a bruise, it's not abuse. It is, it is but, traumatic. To get help or to get that investigated, mm -hmm. you have to have a bruise, you have to have a this broken bone. This is uh, true. So, so yeah. you, we get caught in the middle. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. but if you're going to get help, that's what it has to be. That's the problem. And I always, I, I use the adage, um, you know, two, two wrongs or wrong, two wrongs don't make a right, or how do you get um, uh, a positive from uh, a negative? So there's negative behavior, let's say, or maybe there's not, but there's a negative action. How do you expect to have a positive outcome? Uh, so, you know, that's always kind of been a wonderment to me, how you teach to be good by using something so negative. So. <clears throat> right. right. And we're going to talk a little bit more about our experience of reporting and how it works in the state of Indiana. Um, and we're going to provide some resources if you do suspect child abuse and neglect. Um, I'd also like to talk about sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. Sexual abuse has been in our national news a lot within the last year because of some high profile cases. And I think sexual abuse is something that our community, not just our community, mm -hmm. we, our society does not want to talk about. And by not talking about it, we're not making it go away. So the things that the five of us hear every day is the reason that we're here, that we want mm -hmm whether it goes to Child Protective Services and they determine that they need a legal intervention, um, sexual abuse needs to be talked about. Mm -hmm. And I can say that mm -hmm. all five mm -hmm. of us are very passionate about sticking up 
um, for victims of any type of abuse. But the five of us are not afraid to talk about child abuse or sexual abuse today. So who would like to define sexual abuse? Well, I'll, I'll take that one. Thank you, Connie. <laughs> for, me, um, for me, sexual abuse is defined. It has to have, if any of these three components are missing, to me it's sexual abuse. If, the, uh, if any of the parties do not have consent, if there's no consent, somebody's not mentally uh, incapacitated, if they're too young, uh, um, it just in any way cannot give consent, then you're abusing, you're, uh, you're, the other person is not given permission, you cannot touch the other person in a sexual manner. They're too young, obviously, too young to give consent. Uh, if in any way they're not equal, if, uh, if the person's in a position of power, a teacher, a police officer, and is, is in a relationship with uh, the other person, uh, you're, you're, th that's not equality, and th that is another a way that sexual abuse, I would see as, it, it as being sexual abuse. And the other way is, um, is was there any coercion in any way? Was they, were they tricked, bribed? Uh, manipulated in any way. If that, if they were, then there's not consent, and there, uh, and we have to say that's sexual abuse. So if there's no consent, or if there's one, one of these are missing, consent, equality, or coercion, and in my opinion, is is considered sexual abuse. Right. Thank you. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> sexual abuse can be. Um, very uncomfortable for people to talk about it. Um, I think people are often afraid to talk about it with their kids because we don't want to give them ideas. We don't want to make them curious about sex. We don't want to, um, you know, put an idea in their head. And I am saying we have mm -hmm. to start talk. We have to start mm -hmm. talking about it. We have to start talking about um, safe people. Mm -hmm. um, teaching our kids to pay attention to their gut when their gut mm -hmm. is saying that person's giving me, you know, the creeps, mm -hmm. giving me the heebie-jeebies, and we need to listen to our kids when they're saying mm -hmm. something feels wrong, yeah. um, yeah. because the a the act of sexual abuse is traumatic in itself, mm -hmm. but then the emotional abuse that goes on top of it. Um, whether you're, you know, you're bad, mm -hmm. you can't tell anybody the secret, mm -hmm. you know, it, it continues. So, um, in particular, I think sexual abuse right now is something that our community has to talk about. Um, what are some, I'm sorry, Linda, No, no, no. I, I was just thinking, when it comes to sexual abuse, it's not a visible, um, typically, it's not a visible, um, you know, injury you can see. And so much of the time when children do get the opportunity with someone that for some reason they feel safe to tell, a teacher or their therapist or somebody they feel safe to tell, because it's not visible, they get an initial reaction, especially by maybe their major caregivers, because it's so hard to comprehend um, that they're making it up. And in some instances, um, for reasons that the parent's mind goes to, this child is making this up. Well, <clears throat> children don't know about sex unless they're exposed to it. So when a child tells something about being sexually touched, um, touched in private areas, I mean, I mean, everybody needs to heads up. That was really going on. You, you, first of all, it's very damaging to knee-jerk react and say they're lying. Children can't lie about something they don't know about. If they're talking about a sexual contact, then whether it's a person in their live living area or it's exposure, I cannot tell you how many of cli the clients I have, have have seen pornographic material. They are left to watch television or videos. I, I you know I can't even um, grasp how this is a very common thing pornographic material. So you still have to have heads up, we've got a problem here. And so much of the time, we get a knee-jerk reaction of denial. And that's damaging in itself. Right. Yeah. Right. So <clears throat> what do you, how would we, um, what would be some of the warning signs, I guess, oh. about that a child was possibly being sexually abused. Yeah, right. Get all yeah. that one. <laughs> Trying to be courteous here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Um, Stomach hurting all the time. The way they take Clinginess. The way they play. The way they play, the yes. things they play with, the yes. things they're creating. Uh -huh. um, they don't always just come out and tell you. They're afraid to do that in most cases. Drastic yeah. change in behavior, going from a usually social ha happy kid to now with more withdrawn <laughs> and more clingy to their parent, to maybe the not offending parent. Um, I also, in I work with severe, you know, in a in a program that is all day long with children, and what we um, uh, see is, you know, an inappropriate um, uh, urination or defecation, and. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong physically, and this child starts doing these um, things that they're too old for, and they've already had the training and control in place to not. And I mean, that's a red flag. Somebody, you know, it's it's psychologically a way to keep people away, but uh, or there could be damage at that point. But that's a that's a red flag. Somebody wants to go and make sure they don't need some kind of physiological, you know, doctoring, but. Poor yeah. boundaries, you know. Poor boundaries. Yeah, poor boundaries is another big one. Mm -hmm. um, Inappropriate displays of affection to other people, uh, peers, parents, caregivers, especially in littler children, um, when that just happens out of the blue, might be something to to talk about there. Um, <laughs> a lot of recurring nightmares mm -hmm. at times. A lot of recurring nightmares. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. When teenagers, um, in my experience, I've had several teenagers who. I'm working with them in the summer and they are covered head to toe in um, sweatshirts, mm -hmm. long sleeves. They want to make themselves um, physically covered um, so that they cannot be attacked or um, assaulted again. Um, they make themselves possibly unclean so that people do not want to approach them or touch them. Mm -hmm. um, Start eating a lot so they can get disfigured, so mm -hmm. yeah, stay away from me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And I think a lot of these signs that we're talking mm -hmm. about are for physical abuse also. Well. We see yeah. the same, yeah. we see the same um, I, warning signs, whether it's physical abuse, emotional mm -hmm. abuse, or sexual yes. abuse. Mm -hmm. So making sure that we are paying attention to our kids and notice the changes in our children so that we can ask them. What would you guys recommend if you had some suspicions that... Um, maybe your child or your let's say your your um, son or daughter's friend mm -hmm. was possibly being abused how what would you recommend that the adult does well I, I I would be one the adult to be very careful not to lead but maybe have open-ended questions about uh, you, you know I noticed that you're not playing as much with so-and-so or I noticed that you know you seem um, more tearful and upset and try to begin from that point because what you don't want to do ever is plant a seed that the child thinks that that's the response you want. So, you know, it takes a great deal of skill to know how to interview a child on this basis. So it's, mm -hmm. it's really just trying to open it up that I am here and I can hear what you have to say that's what you really want to present in, in terms of the general public mm -hmm. uh, and then you want to get them to you know someone professional mm -hmm. and you want to do the next step mm -hmm. would that be right yep. oh yes all agree. Okay. as a <laughs> as a play therapist uh, children you know 90 percent <coughs> is going to be nonverbal. Oh, yeah. so that's why play therapy is so important just a, a few items in the room mm -hmm. puppets uh, how about sand therapy? Mm -hmm. Sand therapy is something that I truly do love. Children will go into the sand and you ask them to create a story and they create a story with images and those images that they place in the sand create discussion to where you might ask the question, I, I wonder what this is, I wonder what this is doing, I wonder what this one will say if this one does this and the children will tell you. Then, of course, if we suspect, we have to report. I also think that um, letting a child believe they are educating you, I think for all of the education we all have and experience, um, I tend to get rather uh, ignorant in front of a child so that they can feel comfortable in telling me a story to educate me. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and I think it's important that we are not just mandated reporters, um, but every adult in the state of Indiana is a mandated reporter. So if there are concerns that you have or something just doesn't sit right with you, don't ignore that. You are not only obligated to do it to possibly save a child from a traumatic situation, um, but it's just a really good idea. You'd rather be safe than sorry um, in reporting something. It may not be followed up on. It may not be anything, and it could, um, you know, just be a bad hunch you had. But I'd much rather, I always encourage my parents, if you suspect something and something isn't sitting right, you really need to report that. You can't go wrong by doing that. Um, and that's what I would encourage everyone watching today yeah. to do, is just to realize you are obligated to report and protect our children just as much as mm -hmm. we are. We just see it more often. Mm -hmm. And if you don't report, just think of more victims are being made. It, it, mm -hmm. it will continue and continue. Mm -hmm. When I worked with the sex, the teenage sex offenders, and they were just teenagers at the time, I never, I never came in with the, just the one. They had already had already already 10 victims and they were teenagers so we have to stop it uh, we have to stop it as soon as you know don't be afraid to say well the, you know uh, I'll, maybe they're not didn't do it well maybe they didn't so we got to find out so no more victims are made the uh, the myth uh, one of the myths about uh, that you know that these offenders happen as they are adults. If they start offending as teenagers, these babysitters, I get so many kids who are abused by their babysitters. And so we have to stop this. So, there's Mike. <laughs> I think we're gonna provide the 1-800 number. The state of Indiana has a 1-800 number. It's a hotline um, that is available to report child abuse and neglect. and. We're going to talk a little bit about how that works in the state of Indiana, but I think um, just reiterating what everybody has said here is that it is not our job as adults to investigate it. It is our job to report it. That if you have a hunch, you, you call and report it and then let the professionals mm -hmm. investigate it. So don't ever not call because you think you don't have enough information. We want to make the calls before um, they show up in the ER with a broken bone. Mm -hmm. um, or if you think that someone else is probably going to call, that somebody oh. else has seen this, mm -hmm. um, yeah. it's very much your responsibility just okay. as much as that person's to call. And multiple people can call about one situation. Um, that's how they gather more information as well. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. So right now in the state, this has been in the last couple of two years. Two years. Mm -hmm. Linda, can you kind of explain the system right now okay. as far as how it works in Indiana if somebody did want to make a report? Okay. Um, the state of Indiana reorganized uh, Child Protection DCS, Department of Child Services, uh, and a number of other uh, public agencies two years ago. One of the uh, paramount changes that occurred was the uh, reporting of child abuse was no longer done locally so that uh, they formed a team of about 65 uh, staff in Indianapolis, uh, and we're going to give that number correct. Yes. Okay. Um, and so, uh, so that you call this one eight hundred number, and um, the interviewer goes through a checklist, uh, and they formulate um, information about what the referral is. They go to their supervisor and uh, share that information. At that point, the supervisor makes the call whether this will be turned over to the local DCS or Child Protection Services. Um, what's been happening uh, is that many of those referrals have not reached the local area. And so the investigations have not occurred. Now, um, that is under uh, scrutiny right now because the state has brought together a committee of about 20 professionals. They're judges, law officers, um, people who run large agencies and small agencies are all part of this committee. And um, they're having hearings and uh, you may go down and publicly speak to the uh, uh, committee. The first or the second week that this occurred was about uh, how child abuse is being handled based on this new fo newly formed or in its infancy actually of two years uh, central state 
um, calling in and, and having them disseminate the abuse reports, as, whether it's sexual or, or uh, physical. Mm -hmm. So um, it's in question of how well it's working. Right. But we st and we still mm -hmm. are um, working to report as mm -hmm. much you know as much mm -hmm. as we can. Mm -hmm. um, in right now, the statistics show us that four children will di will die today mm -hmm. before the day is over, based on um, how many how many actual cases of child abuse and neglect. That is an e it is an epidemic in our country, and so to say. Um, to, or to ignore a system, to ignore what um, we're saying for our kids, we can't. We cannot ignore it. That mm -hmm. that statistic is alarming, mm -hmm. and that is why we're here. That that is what brought uh, the five of us here. Um, Dottie, I wanted to address the whole process, and while there's some hideous things being done who, it, by people who need to have. Um, criminal, uh, you know, repercussions. I, I also want it to be seen as a therapeutic and helpful uh, intervention to troubled families. And this is not an isolation of uh, a certain social, economic, or cultural group of people. This is across all cultural, all social, economic uh, levels of our community. And um, it is not always an awful. Uh, thing to call someone in because they get the help they, they need. And I think that's important. And then we've got some questions. I think it is important mm -hmm. to say that our the uh, adults that um, may engage in physical abuse or emotional abuse, being a parent is hard work. Mm -hmm. And we recognize the, the difficulties that parents face. And so our job is not to come in and say, you're a terrible parent. Um, our job is to try and work with families and advocate for our kids at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, I witnessed um, about two months ago a young teenager. She was being forced to go into a car. I was in shock, but I managed to phone the police, and I didn't hear anything else about it. I don't know whether she was kidnapped, or, or whatever, but I didn't hear anything else from it. But I reported it. That's good. Good. It was at two o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. This girl, she must be only about sixteen, seventeen, being forced along by her boyfriend. And I reported it, but that's right. I didn't hear anything else. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. know if yeah. she's I don't okay. Think you will. You <laughs> won't. You mm -hmm. won't hear. Mm -hmm. And we no. often don't hear. No. I mean, no. even if we re make a report, we often don't hear. Nobody calls us to say, here's what's going to happen with that case. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of left out there, and we keep our fingers crossed. But I'm a witness. Would they not want to try to get in touch with me? In, <laughs> in sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> in my experience, yeah. that isn't. Not. Because then there's also, you've got Child Protective Services, and then the police investigation. Mm -hmm. Like so, the police, if they pick it up as a criminal, right? Mm -hmm. If they pick mm -hmm. it up as a criminal charge, the police may investigate further, mm -hmm. but DCS won't interview mm -hmm. people unless they're direct family. And well, that's not right. Right. There's that's so not mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, but there's not enough uh, manpower mm -hmm. to be able to do that. Um, obviously, if you see a robbery and often they'll do that they'll go and interview the persons that are right there mm -hmm. but that's that that's part of the flaw in the system is when it's abuse they don't follow it the same way and again it's because there's not enough individuals out there to do that now, I was just reading something here in the year 2000 there was more than 2.9 million child abuse cases reported and that was mm -hmm. just the year 2000 I assure you that was the tip of the iceberg. Just the tip. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, that's just what, what was that was just yeah. what you mm -hmm. could see. The rate of child abuse of any industrialized country. Mm -hmm. Yes. What a shameful yeah. uh, statement. But I really commend you, Patty, to Report have done it. that. Right, right. I mean, really. You mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you. I was fighting myself. 
I said, yeah. do I get involved? Do I not get involved? Mm -hmm. I said, no, that poor kid. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether she's dead or alive. Mm -hmm. And that has been plaguing me for I'm two sure. months. I'm sure. You did sure. what you could do. Oh, you, you did. Do. That's what you can do. Mm -hmm. you know? It's better than not doing nothing, and mm -hmm. then, <laughs> you know, real, then really in trouble. Mm -hmm. so, well, the a police car did come about four or five minutes after the fact, mm -hmm. but they couldn't find anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. See, that, that's what gets me, you know. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. one of my goals and why I, the reason that I've been working with Terry on this idea of mm -hmm. the Fort Wayne mm -hmm. Children's Museum and the reason that I asked these four people to be here today is because I want us to be a community that d doesn't hesitate to get involved. Mm -hmm. I want us to be the community that says, we're not gonna tolerate, we're not gonna minimize um, what's happening to our kids every day. I want us to be proactive, to know our resources, mm -hmm. to be out there sticking up for these kids. And Patty, that's a great example. Mm -hmm. Of that that's what that's my vision mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. I want to be out of a job because I don't have any more abused children to work with like, put me out of a job Fort Wayne let's <laughs> let's mm -hmm. um let's make it stop mm -hmm. um I like to know why do people abuse their children or their peers in the first place something they did happen to them when they were young and on and on and on, going backwards into the generations? I think it's been said that it's been a s cyclical kind of thing that... Power and control. Power and control, but it comes mm -hmm. down in generations many times. I can think of several families that I've worked with that when you do the history, you hear about the, the abuse that went on. And even when they know their family history fairly well, they talk about a grandmother or an uncle that was abused and, and no one did anything about it. So it's a, it's a generational, psych, cyclical kinds of things happen. Uh, and we need, when we treat these children, we're hoping the cycle is broken. When it comes to sexual abuse, if you as a parent were sexual, uh, if you are an effect, the people who sexually abuse it's a myth to say that they always abuse, they sexually abuse yeah. others. That's a myth. Uh, more than likely, what's going to happen is you're going to be, end up dysfunctional some other way. Mm -hmm. uh, people who've been sexually abused, it's about maybe one in ten will sexually abuse others. So that part is not uh, generational. Yeah, generational. But mm -hmm. but but that person who's been sexually abused. Something will happen, you know, that will become dysfunctional. You start doing drugs, start being overly promiscuous, mm -hmm. you know, other other things will happen. But mm -hmm. when it comes to sexual abuse, that's just not passed along. That's a little, that's more of a myth. Mm -hmm. But physical abuse, emotional mm -hmm. abuse, that seems to be more cyclical. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's also a lack of education in mm -hmm. our culture about parenting. Yeah. Um, and it's almost taboo to say, I don't really know how to handle my children. Uh -huh. um, and you're not given a handbook. I mean, I know that's cliche, but we're not given a handbook when you have children or when you become a caregiver uh -huh. you, through taking, you know, taking um, care of your other family members. So it's okay to ask for help. And a lot of my job is just educating families uh -huh. and parents on what is what is appropriate and what's not, and making uh -huh. myself a partner with those families, allowing them to lead me and tell mm -hmm. me what they do in their family. They're the expert on their family. I'm just there to guide them. I'm just there mm -hmm. to reshape them. Um, that's a lot of, of what we can do as a community to educate parents mm -hmm. about what they could do differently. I have to say, I always get really excited when I have a parent, and I just had it happen this week, so it was really exciting. Come in, you know, with a small child and a baby, young, young person, and say to me, I just really know I need some help with parenting. And I'm like, I get, you know, rather excited because you don't get that forthcoming mm -hmm. very, that, that it's not that forthcoming. So, yeah, parenting and education, wow, that's, that's big. Does anybody else, we have about 10 minutes, anybody else want to ask a question or <coughs> Yeah, I have a question. Um, what uh, do you tell them when, when somebody comes to you about, how, about the right thing to do as a parent, what would you tell them? What's the right thing to do? Yeah. Yeah. How 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 would you train a parent that comes to you and asks how they should parent? Well, I'll tell you mm -hmm. what. Thank you. It's the most difficult job there is. Mm -hmm. However, um, I'll mm -hmm. tell. I'll ask. The first thing I ask is, Do you mm -hmm. have a paddle at home? You don't mm -hmm. need it. 
get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Sit down and talk to your child, ask them how they're feeling rather than telling them how you think they feel. Mm -hmm. That does a lot of damage. Telling a child how you think they feel. Well, they need to know that they can feel free to talk about what's happening. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the best parenting skills is to make them feel safe. Help them know that they feel safe. Just like you do when they feel safe what food they're going to eat. They know it's okay. You cooked it. They want to be able to do the same thing with their feelings. And that's an excellent parent that can do that. And you can do that. All parents can do that. You know, I also ask the parent, well, where is the, what is the most troublesome? Because, you know, you could say globally, gosh, parenting is difficult. And, but, you know, each family, you know, lives a certain way. And I don't think any of us are here to tell families how to live. Or, uh, but I think I, I approach it from, well, what are the most problematic and upsetting moments for you? And I begin there, you know, to see what. And then, you know, how have you previously handled it? Um, and then I might give them some professional information, but... Um, I want to hear what it is they're most having the, the most tr struggle with because I, it's a global, such a global thing that I could just, I can lecture on it. We can all lecture on it in front of an audience, but when you're really dealing face to face with a family, you need to go where they are and listen to what they struggle with and begin to talk about options and alternatives and why, but a little bit at a time. <laughs> I also try to talk with mm -hmm. parents about what their role is as a parent and mm -hmm. specifically what does discipline mean because discipline is not punishment or consequences. It's a way of teaching your child mm -hmm. and guiding your child. It's from the word disciple, which means to teach. So it's teaching your child the values and morals that you you have in your family. You're mm -hmm. teaching them how to behave in public. You're teaching them how to act when company's over, mm -hmm. teaching them how to act in school, what's appropriate, what's not. Um, and I think if I can kind of shift their focus a little bit from a punishment-based type of parenting and after the fact, then you're going to get in trouble, to a preventative way of I'm teaching them how to do the things I want them to do again. If I can get them to shift their focus, I've seen a lot of positive results. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's the parent is stressed. The parent is, mm -hmm. is an angry person. Mm -hmm. They have to work on themselves because they, they can't teach. Right. So, you know, you mm -hmm. have to, you know, what's up with you? You know, you have to work. Sometimes they don't see it's the, sometimes it's what they're needing mm -hmm. to work on themselves mm -hmm. to then to, then they can share with the, their child. And we have seen a rise in the economic, due to the economic uh, stressors for these families. Um, you can imagine uh, that you know they can't make the mortgage payment and they haven't got any money coming their way and how that might feel inside and then a child spills milk or breaks something uh, uh, you know that belongs to the parent that there's that you know combustibility that happens too so we have seen child abuse rise in these last couple of years we, we uh, simply just tell parents to take time outs Mm -hmm. Tell their children to take time out. Why can't they? It's okay to go to another room, go for a walk, let their children know they're just going to take a time out. They're not leaving them. And then they can reprocess and regroup, you know, mm -hmm. and not just react impulsively and hurt a child. And I guess that's a place where the public could go, you know, and you know that a parent is stressed out in your family, extended or your neighborhood, maybe maybe we don't do this enough anymore, but to offer some support just in listening or, you know, a cup of coffee or a Coke, you know? Mm -hmm. I have one last question. Um, you counsel the parents as well because they were abused when they were kids, most of them, right? It, it can occur. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you do... Not always, but... Not, not always, always yeah. but you do... Mm -hmm. because they are the ones that need the help most mm -hmm. uh ju not just the child that they abuse so the the parents need guidance and love and compassion mm -hmm. as well as healing and sometimes jail time sometimes jail <laughs> and sometimes time. jail time if they're yeah. if they have harmed that child or caused some death or cause sometimes yes. they need jail time too huh? yeah. right. they, have to, with that. <laughs> they have to they have to 
pay for what they have done. That's true. Sometimes, yeah. I'm not saying all the time, but yes. But they still need mm -hmm. help. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, and they often did not get the things we're trying to teach yeah. them to give to their kids mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. children themselves. So we have a lot of damaged individuals mm -hmm. that never really knew how to attach to people and have healthy functional relationships, don't know how to communicate that to their kids. So a lot of um, what we do and what we mm -hmm. see is damaged kids in the form of adults. Yeah. Great point. Now we have about four minutes, so would you like to go make some closing comments? Thank you for your uh, audience, for your mm -hmm. questions. I just want to say, you, and, uh, <laughs> you know, that why America has so much child abuse, this is a culture of violence. It's a culture of inequality. Your point is excellent. Uh, there is no excuse for a country this rich with billionaires to have one out of five children hungry. No excuse whatsoever except sheer meanness. Mm -hmm. And people do get frustrated and they don't have any outlet and they don't have any answer and they don't feel like there's anywhere to go. You guys are giving great insight and helping people to think they're not alone. I think that's mm -hmm. the main thing. So in saying that, uh, let me just have you guys make some closing comments. Start with Dottie. Okay. I would just like to say, Terry, thank you for organizing this because I do think that as a community we need to talk about it and I appreciate the opportunity um, and thank you to my colleagues who all are willing to come down and um, talk about something that you guys are so passionate about and thank you for what you do every day. So Vanessa? Um, I guess I would just encourage people we need to be maybe a little bit more connected to our friends, our families. Um, I have people tell me all the time that I'm a little bit nosy and that is okay with me because if I'm connected to them, they might be more willing to, to take what I'm saying and be serious about it. So um, just get connected out there. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in the profession that we're all in, you know, there's some really fine um, and talented people who can provide the service. Um, and provide help and other resources. And my concern is that today we're, you know, little people aren't voters, um, so they're not looked after too much. We have, um, uh, they're not important constituents, and I'm trying not to be overly political, but, you know, we have to be able to support to fund things, the, the funding for child mm -hmm. uh, protection and um, all the resources for children have mental health has drastically been cut. I grant you, many things have, and they're all important. But since we're here today, I want to make that comment that there, there's not enough um, financial resources coming, and um, too many are going without. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, all I have to say is that children are are in property, and we we have to uh, give them hope. We have to provide strength and courage for them, and I think we do that, and you as parents have to do that. Um, I love working with kids, and I love helping them, and I know I do help them, um, but I, we need to keep uh, making sure that they're safe and protected, and they're not property, and so, and, and to give hope. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you, mm -hmm. Tom, you want to... Uh well, you know, have your friend at least make I, uh, your camera appearance. The, uh, the children asked me to make sure that I introduce you to Wilbur. This is Wilbur. Mm -hmm. Hello, how are you all? <laughs> and, and Wilbur is the one they talk to often about their issues. They talk to me all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, so he's, he's there. The children feel safe because of Wilbur. And they sometimes hit me, but that's okay too. Mm -hmm. But that's Wilbur. Mm -hmm. Wilbur is a good friend. And the book, if you wish to have this, each book that's sold, three books are given. It's returned back to the community. And uh, with enough donation, I'm hoping that we can do that and give books to people and help them to find solutions to Amazon or discovering the lost key. Thank you. Well, I want to thank everybody. Uh, we've got to wrap up, but especially Dottie for... Yeah, putting this show to together, lot. hosting it. Uh, fantastic. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> like Michael Jackson said, we are.
We are the world. We make a change today for a better tomorrow. Look, I'm here. Don't be afraid to shed a tear. Tell me your problems. Go ahead. I want to hear. Look, you're my child. I really want to lend an ear. If you want, I'll start. I'll even tell you what I fear. I'm scared of spiders. Yes, I'm afraid of heights. I'm scared to lose you. The thought makes me want to cry. Let's start fresh. Let's put our differences aside. I could make it better. Please, just let me try. Tell you about my problems. Now you want to listen. All this time I needed you. Always you were missing. Remember you would beat me after late night drinking. I had to go to school. The next Day I was limping. The teachers there would ask. I would tell them that I fell. Cause no one there could help me. Who was there to tell? Forever I'ma hate you. With passion as I yell. I never will forgive you even if I go to hell. As many things that you've been through. Just be strong and you will make it through. We seen you fall and now we see you stand. You gotta go through this. You must understand. To the parents, only time will tell, and you can ask for forgiveness, but forgive yourself, cause everybody makes mistakes. We should know that well. Somewhere, somehow, even an angel.